I just finished a master's in architecture, and the thesis was resonating soundscapes, altering soundscapes in exterior environments using Hemholtz resonators in ceramic bricks. I'm a Portland native. I'm Joe Kirchma. My last name means a pub or a tavern in Czech. I went to University of Portland in business, graduated in 2008. The thing that we're focusing on is London and sound in London. So I was living there for the last eight years and I worked at a smaller startup. We were selling 3D printers, CNC machines, laser cutters uh, from 2015 on and then worked for a larger company, Barclays Bank, a larger corporation. And we also were having a lab similar to this kind of space and incorporated the hardware side as well as the prototyping and education side, as well as started my own business. But within that space, we took over the Olympic Village. Now this was a media center during the 2012 Olympics in London, and we converted it to a 700 person co-working space and had all sorts of companies ranging from, uh, well, in, in my field it was the hardware um, side of VR, AR companies, electronic bike, e-battery companies, and architecture firms. And then the other side of the building was University College London. And I was looking at this facility and it's amazing. It's really state-of-the-art stuff. Uh, they have a main campus um, in downtown, but we are East London and they really expanded well into this area. And that's a, a sound booth there and light booth. And they had a hardware lab to dream of, Haas CNC machines, uh, large robotic arms. And I thought maybe I should work here. And a professor said, no, you shouldn't work here. You should get your postgrad from here. It's like, oh, what can I do there? Well, a business major with some, you know, the hardware experience, but I don't have the academics. He said, well, we've got this program. There's three of them there and it's under architecture. There's design for performance interaction and you, a lot of uh, Arduinos and, and body and, and scanning. Bio ID dealing with uh, mycelium and uh, fungi and, and how nature plays a role in architecture and design for manufacture. And I found like, this is it. This is what I wanted to do. We had the ultimate playpen and I'm sure all of you guys would love to, you know, come over there and we could really, uh, make whatever you wanted. And so after being rejected one time, I tried it again and they accepted me. So I said, I'll stay for a little while longer here. And I was looking into noise in London and it's a noisy city. It's interesting that parks around London have all of this traffic and they're sandwiched by all this noise. And it's kind of ironic that we go to these natural areas to escape this urban noise, and yet we are bombarded with it. The area that we're in, uh, our school is in Stratford in East London here. So in, the, in our program, we were looking into the lack of solutions for exterior sound barriers, dealing specifically with low frequency noise in traffic. And our boundaries that we had to work with, the material that we had to use was ceramics. Uh, our director said, we're gonna focus on this as the medium to work with. And different groups broke up into researching different areas on this. So some were doing ram to earth and looking at structures. And there were five of us that were looking into sound. And we thought for a problem statement, how, I, how might we improve our health through the quality of our exterior environment soundscape? And on further research, we looked into even stroke and found that cardiovascular disease rose by 8% for every 10 decibels of noise exposure. Um, this is from the World Health Organization. And you know we spend money and resources trying to prevent noise from going into our living spaces, but there's still an imbalance for solutions for exterior. So we have a lot of indoor um, solutions, but how can we use this for exterior, especially when it comes to traffic noise, the low frequency uh, spreads far beyond like the road and can disrupt many surrounding areas. So our focus obviously was on transportation. This is a, another sound map here. And we were looking in the range of 20 to 300 Hertz. So in the low frequency range here and 
that's, again, where a lot of the, the traffic noise is going to be heard. And London was actually the noisiest city in Europe, with over 1.6 million people being subjected to hearing hazards over 55 decibels. Uh, this was from the United Nations. So I found that interesting. And how London, there's, there's no limit on how loud something can be in London. There's um, times where they have to be quiet, but the volume doesn't matter. Looking at the acoustic surfaces though, so this was all new to me, but there's three different types kind of that you can use for sound to, to move. It's either reflective, it's either absorbed or it's diffused in the material. And it was interesting that we have indoor options where we try to shelter ourselves. We use double pane glass. We try to make as much um, padding from the outside world to keep that out than in. And then there's a couple options that you've seen. They're not the most beautiful, elegant options for freeways. No one's really uh, winning awards for that. So we were looking into soundscapes. And soundscape is the acoustic environment as perceived by humans in context. Uh, the acoustic environment is a combination of all the acoustic resources, natural and artificial, within a given area as modified by the environment. However, soundscape design in architecture not only focus, focuses on the audio aspect, uh, which is objective values, but also can considers how to improve the combined sensory experience of other senses, such as light, touch, um, and maybe even smell. These would be subjective factors. So within our group, we were looking at how can soundscape be focused on um, more than one sense? This is not the first uh, to think of sound in, in architecture. Uh, the guy up there who's basically the father of architectural acoustics is Marcus Vitruvius. Da Vinci uh, made a, a famous uh, illustration of him. He was born in Italy around 75 BC and died sometime after 15 BC. And his only document that survived was De Architectura, which is the... Um, 10 books on architecture. And he dedicated this to Emperor Augustus. And in this, he outlined some basic um, uses of improving sound in architecture through using bronze urns called echia. Now these would be placed in a theater and it would open up to face the stage. And the stage actor's voice would cause the vessel to resonate and produce an increased harmonized note. Now these urn arrangements could be tuned depending if the venue was small or large. Now, acousticians have debated whether they were effective in either amplifying the sound or if they reduced reverberations leading to a better listening environment. As well as in the 1400s, especially the 1430s, they were found um, over 100 churches in France had these pots that were found in the nave of this church and all of these uh, areas in um, Auvergne, France. And of these, there's 29 pots, 27 are present, but they would, they would look like this and they'd be up kind of in the ceilings and, and walls. So it's very curious of what, what, what's going on here. And what it is, is Mr. Hemholtz coming into play. Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Hemholtz. He was basically a German Renaissance man. He lived from 1821 to 1894. He had improved fields in physiology, the age of the earth, psychology, the origins of the solar system, physics, and philosophy. But in 1862, he wrote this book called On the Sensations of Tone, where he explained how a device could focus on a small frequency tone in a multiplex of sounds. And what this is, is a Helmholtz absorber or resonator. And what you have is a area, a neck, and then a cavity. And this acts as a spring. So acoustic sound is turned into heat when it's absorbed into this because this neck is um, basically absorbing a specific bandwidth of frequencies using uh, this equation. So you can tune that to absorb um, certain sounds that you want. This is used in car exhaust mufflers as well as Airplane engines, um, they used it as an acoustic liner surrounding the motor. I had never heard of Hemholtz resonators. 
And then now once you see it, you can't unsee it. And you're gonna be looking for these everywhere you go now. So just a quick example, a couple examples. Um, there's in this theater in Queen Elizabeth Hall, there are these holes in the walls. It's like, what's going on here? Well, this was actually uh, one of my professors uh, had made this and what they're doing is they're changing to four different sizes to absorb um, specific frequencies that you want because you have a neck and then behind that you have your cavity. Also, the Elizabeth line, the newest line that they put in London had all of these, um, these beautiful facades, but what they're actually, they're not just for aesthetic reasons. The more important function was absorbing noise and people were saying, wow, you hear how quiet it is here. Uh, same with Paddington Station. Uh, they're not saving bricks there. They're actually removing every other so that you have a neck and then a cavity. So once you see it, you're not gonna be able to unsee it. A company that we had seen uh, use these for traffic um, is based out in Northern Italy and they're using clay and cement and inorganic oxides to make a whole bunch of range of colors. Uh, but it's basically a cinder block with slits in it. And this one has also some high density rock wool to extra absorb, as well as some other frequencies. And same with another Collinwell um, company out of uh, the UK. And these are actually pretty good in absorbing the specific range. Now you're gonna be able to absorb every range, but the certain ranges that you wanna focus on. So we started looking into testing for ourselves. Is ceramic really gonna work in this? Uh, you know, being burdened with a, a material is, um, is very limiting. So we looked at some micro testing of materials and we had some wood that we carved into a, this wavy pattern. This foam, the Sheffield foam is our standard and we used an impedance tube here. And within that wood pattern, we also grew mycelium and we're testing that. Uh, this wouldn't work well for exterior environments, but then we had to move to ceramic and we noticed that actually slip casting this terracotta was, well, it was okay, but how are we gonna make this work for us? Well, you can uh, do this thing called burnouts where you take slip, which is a liquid clay, and you take a sponge or something that's going to be sacrificed. You dip that in the clay, let that dry, and then when you fire it in the kiln, the sponge is burnt out and the clay is kept. So you've had this very interesting uh, complex structure that can be used. And could this possibly work to absorb sound? So we built our own test box to uh, be able to test our future bricks that we were gonna build. And this was just a concrete box with a speaker on it and it ran through a frequency so it would make an, you know, an entire frequency uh, sound wave. So it'd go like and uh, within that certain wave, uh, you could see, oh yeah, at this one uh, output, uh, the bricks or mini bricks actually worked. So we had our box, we had our test facilities. Now it was on to the site. And again, we're focusing on East London here. It's sandwiched between some some roads underneath and some train lines up above. So we had a wonderful uh, noise uh, machine on both the north and the south. And the overground here passes right through a lovely area that was home for studios and restaurants and bars and community gardens and event spaces that they wanted to grow. So we said, well, maybe if we could make some sort of pavilion that would alter the soundscape, would this have the potential to improve natural sounds like birds chirping and water and conversations and also minimize traffic noise? So minimize a low frequency, but keep mid and high frequencies. So the problem statement, again, how might we improve our health through the quality of our exterior environment soundscape? The research question was to investigate alternative strategies for the design and manufacture of fired clay Hemholtz resonators to alter the soundscape of external spaces. And then I had four objectives 
that I was looking into. One was a proof of concept to make sure that these shells would work um, absorbing a certain frequency. Two, it would be in low frequency. Also to develop a design to workflow um, fabrication so that this could be somewhat repeated. And to incorporate other senses, would this also possibly be a visual reminder? Um, could we use touch and or smell in this final pavilion? So our group split up into four different um, methods. One guy in our group looked into extrusion. And it was really interesting of how he was going to make some sort of pavilion. This was the fuzzy front end where we all didn't know. We had a year to work on this. We didn't know what this was going to be. Two other people in our group looked at bricks in a facade using Hemholtz resonators, but they're inverting the neck. So Hemholtz resonator can work with either, I'm giving it away early, but a neck extruded out or inside. As long as you have a neck and cavity, it'll be able to absorb. Another, I'll skip me, and then another guy was looking into robotic arms into reflection, uh, but he's also using a brick. And to be truthfully honest, I wasn't sure what I was doing at this moment. Probably pretty clear. I did know that I wanted to look at all of the opportunities that we had. So there's clay 3D printing, which is what's going on here with these mini bricks. So I started 3D printing with clay. Now it's different than regular FDM machines. You're extruding something and it's without the temperature. And so you're basically working with vacuums and um, air uh, compression. So you want to have this chamber. It's, it's huge. And it kind of pushes this clay through this screw using shear factors and, and everything um, to move the clay around. Now, it works well with certain shapes that I tested to like extrude out and see with the overhang, but your, your draft angles and your overhangs are gonna be very limited to say the least, and it takes a long time. So I wasn't gonna go down that route. So yeah, this was what we were doing here with these samples that you can come see afterwards, uh, taking it through Grasshopper and being able to change um, whatever we wanted for our G-code and adapt um, the tool head in any, um, any ways that we saw fit. And they were interesting, and I thought maybe these bricks could interlock somehow, but 3D printing just wasn't going to work. So then I looked into slip casting, where you have your mold, you take a plaster mold around that, that is going to be able to uh, dry out, and you pour your liquid clay in, your slip, and it will suck up all that moisture. And then you'll have a, basically a hollow uh, form after you pour it out, and hooray, you have your, your piece. And then you let that dry after 24 hours from going from leather hard to bone dry, and then fire it in the kiln. And so we're looking at the first three prototypes. I was, I was going with a regular standard brick size. The important thing was because we're going from 20 to 300 hertz, it must have a large enough cavity and neck for a UK brick. So there's three different types of bricks. I didn't know this. There's the US brick, there's a UK brick, and there's an Australian brick. Australia is the largest, they're nine inches. Then the UK is like 8.45 inches. Then the US is at eight. Like, can we fix this? This is, we're <laughs> the smallest brick. So yeah, to make these cavities um, in the brick, it would need to be hollow. And this would maybe also worked as being lighter and easier for um, the bricklayers to, to handle and, and be able to use. So the first brick I made in Fusion, and I thought, okay, I'll make a kind of place that can be removed here, which would be plaster, and then the outside would be plaster as well, with a front of being a different neck. So I 3D printed it and prototyped it, and I wanted the neck to kind of be different widths to allow for different frequencies to absorb. And the first prototype was this kind of plaster block that I had uh, different levels here so that the brick could be raised and lowered um, depending on the size of the uh, cavity that I would like. This was then slip cast. And you can see that I've got um, two little holes here for the front of this. And those were to be able to take in different widths. Um, for different frequencies for an interchangeable neck. 
And yes, it looks wonderful. How, this is the fabrication workflow where you design, cast it, dry, and then fire. However, there were main, major issues coming on here. First was that uh, <laughs> the cavity, internal cavity, um, that piece keep floating up. Um, it wasn't weighing down. The plaster, once it had been cast, was very difficult to remove. And there weren't any clean edges around this whole brick. And the biggest part, it was warping on me. You can see why. There's a big piece out the front missing. So maybe could I change this inner cavity into three different pieces here? And those would be filled with plaster with threaded inserts. And that way, I could flip the whole thing upside down, pour my clay in. And this one, I had a uh, piece of plaster on top with a tube in it, uh, with a hole in it, so I would pour it. I'd cut that off, or else I would just pour in my plaster, and then take out the three plaster blocks. You can obviously see that there's going to be some problems here. Uh, same fabrication workflow style. And we've got some issues that the clay would tear when these corners um, would shrink uh, from the outside and inside. Also, the three plaster blocks were not as easily to remove as expected. The clay would also shrink and grip the blocks. And even if I removed it successfully, the walls were still warping and ripping. We could see that there. So I was fighting this plaster clay relationship. I wasn't letting the form be hollow. So I said, well, okay, maybe I can make an entire 90 degree because I still want to keep with that brick shape, that classic brick shape. So I put a bunch of more threaded inserts into plaster and took some bolts with washers and held the whole thing together and then poured in my clay let that sit for 40 minutes, then pour it out. The perpendicular angles keep being this classic brick shape. And I also experimented with some other materials. This was dark clay with vulcanized grog particles, um, stoneware, just different clays. Uh, but mainly, you can, again, see what we're coming with here. The drying, these were the best photos, by the way, these cracking and fired, and the fabrication workflows of the first three prototypes are okay. Okay, we're learning things, but we've still got major issues of the pore hole is really small, it's warping, it's cracking, it's exploding in the kiln, uh, we've got uneven drying, and um, I'm now like fighting the entire process. I'm not working with what plaster does. I'm saying, no, you're going to be a 90 degree angle here. You're going to be this perfect rectangle in with slip casting. And I'm forcing this clay to do something that it's not wanting to do either. It's, it's drooping in certain places. It's not sticking on certain areas and, and falling in on itself. So these weren't natural for um, both of these uh, materials to be uh, used in this way. Yeah, different clay, same results. The materials may change, the outcomes didn't. And a big glaring aspect here was the Hemholtz resonator was becoming very difficult to absorb low frequency. We have a small, teeny neck, and the cavity size is actually getting smaller as well. So how could having like a two-part simple plaster mold built with complexity in it be used to possibly produce a more successful outcome. So the rectangular brick wasn't working, but to understand other loads and, and um, future iterations on this brick, I tried generative design. And although that it wasn't used in further CAD models, it led to a new under understanding that the bricks could fit together possibly in a way that could be made up with larger, more interlocking patterns than traditional rectangular brick design. But I was still nervous that this wasn't gonna work because we had about six months left of the course. And I didn't wanna be one of those students that's like, 
yeah, you know, conclusions, uh, not really conclusive. And it's like, well, that's, that's kind of lame. I want to have something to like say, yes, like I put my, my name to this. This was great. It worked. Then the other guy, Bingza, um, who was doing the robotic arm manipulation here, he's looking at that reflective and diffusive surfaces with robotic arms. And he was cutting and carving um, with personalized attachments on this arm and playing around with different materials. And he had this shape um, that he was using. And I said, that's an interesting brick that you have there. I like this shape, like what's going on? And what's happening is it's a four part brick making up one Hemholtz resonator. Nine resonator with our neck and our large cavity, but also on the flip side of that, we have a neck and a small cavity. And each of these would now work on both sides of a wall. So you would reverse it. This four part cavity would have that neck to start with. And then on the flip side of that wall, you're gonna have another cavity being made of those bricks. So I thought by adapting this, it was interesting on using like these external geometry shapes to make this brick. So I said, let's CNC it out of foam first. So I made my, see my mold of one half, then took a plaster cast of that. You put four different little, little divots in here and then you put like marbles or ball bearings in there so that you, you have a location so that they can be lined up perfectly. And then I took a big drill bit and drilled two holes for my pour holes that I'd be able to use to pour in the, the slip. Pour it in the slip, poured it out after 40 minutes, and I had a brick. Now, this was solid. So, same fabrication workflow, but we've got some more issues. It's cracking, so this whole brick is now drying completely at uneven rates. Demolding was difficult, pouring out the clay was difficult. It's, it's obviously warping and cracking. And I'm in a worse spot. And the worst thing is, I can't even fire this in the kiln. So it's gonna explode. I'm going into desperation mode. Let's poke a bunch of holes in it. And that'll help it dry. I wasn't even gonna bother putting that in the kiln. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm not done with this yet. It's, it's saying, okay, what do I have? I have this, this brick, I have this shape. Let's make the neck of this, rather than trying to make it small, let's make it big and put it up in the front. It's kind of, let's celebrate that fact. So put this neck in the major part of this cavity. And that's when it kind of hits me. And it's a beautiful moment where you're, you're on this path and you never thought you'd go down this certain road and you realize not only am I making a brick that has a Hemmelt's resonator on one side and a Hemmelt's resonator on the back side as well. So you have two different tones that you can um, adjust and tune for. But you also have a major Hemmelt's resonator here of the brick itself. You have a neck and you have a cavity on the inside. So you've got three Hemmelt's resonators out of one. And that was all incorporated into the brick itself. So with this excitement, I'm pouring in the slip, 40 minutes, pour it back out, and then let that dry overnight. And we have our brick. And these were then fired in the kiln. No problems in the kiln. There were, same fa fabrication prototype. There were some issues still. Demolding on the cast was an issue. They'd stick to it. Sometimes they'd fall in, they wouldn't stick, but about 60% of them were successful. Some talcum powder was added to help with demolding. And I'm sticking with just terracotta on all of this, as well as compressed air to help release uh, the molds here. And then there was the testing part of this to see how much they shrunk. Now, I originally designed that they would shrink by 12%. And then after being scanned, these were accurate as the initial design. So yes, from the CAD to the fired brick, these measurements in terracotta stayed consistent with the increased size of the digital file. And we had our successful outcome of four bricks making up a 
neck, and cavity for a Helmholtz resonator. Then it was time for major production mode. And I built, I think, around like 50 of these. And it was important on the construction site for the bricklayer not to need to have the architect or the designer showing how to install each brick, but instead by having the assembly pre-programmed in the block that's obvious and clear. So the most important part was your first layer of bricks that they were all either the small cavity or the large uh, cavity that would be facing this, this, this certain way. Incorporating these techniques may lead to other efficient and elegant designs in sound absorbing structures. So you can see there that was the front side and then I'd flipped it back on the back side. And then was the testing site. Uh, so we took our box and we were uh, actually surprised to find out that the frequency that we had designed these for and around 310 Hertz that they were actually the Helmholtz resonators were working as good as wood and or foam when they were tested in this box next to the microphone. So this was actually a surprise that ceramic can work with Helmholtz properties. And then it, the current size of these bricks, you'd still have to factor in scaling them up to absorb even lower frequencies of noise coming from the overground and train and traffic. But yes, this concept did work. These were then glazed. The top six of these were glazed. This was the day of the show. So don't judge my grout um, bricklaying skills. And um, they, this glaze would also help with weatherproofing the bricks from exterior elements of freeze thaw and um, other weathering. And as well, it gave it a really nice look. So some future work was maybe lessening the noise from all these trains would actually uh, be absorbed and other sounds of the soundscape of, of nature, like birds chirping or conversations would be brought more to the forefront. Not only could we see this benefit the audio environment, but also have a visual impact on the land. Uh, by seeing this pavilion, people can be reminded of noise in urban environments, uh, which can have a negative impact on people's health. And maybe city planners would take note of this in considering you know, characteristics of sound um, when it comes to planning and in nature, as well as the integration with the structure with the environment. Birds could use this as homes and fill this with nest, and that would increase the absorption for more frequencies. And moss and algae and, and fungi and stuff can grow on these bricks, which would help with the visual, but also um, the absorption uh, of, of sound. Some alternative methods of making these would be to do high pressure resin mold casting. And that's a different kind of method where with regular plaster, you're getting about 100 to 150 cycles before it's um, basically full. It can't take any more um, water from all the, all the dirt and, 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 and things. The pores get clogged. But with this high pressure casting, resin casting, you can do 40,000 cycles. So this is faster and cheaper, uh, less water. It's how toilets are made. And this pavilion would directly impact the soundscape from an audio level, but also act as a visual reminder. And this would remind that acoustics and architecture should be designed in parallel with building environments. For example, architects may design a structure without considering acoustic issues and then put up sound dampening panels once the project was complete as an afterthought. So in D-Architecture, Marcus Vitruvius wrote that the idea of building should have three elements, utilitas, firmitas, and venustas. And this translates into sturdy, useful, and beautiful. And hopefully this pavilion checks all three of those long-established requirements. Thank you. <laughs>